Hi folks, Brother Nero here, and today I wanted to talk as quick, briefly as I can about J.K. Rowling and her new book. Now, in the past, I've never really spoken much about J.K. Rowling, but I, th I feel I should point out, just you know, to be a bit of a hipster, that I've hated this woman for years before anyone else did. And the reason for that is because she normalised and made it acceptable for weird, greasy, single middle-aged men to queue outside of a bookshop at midnight, surrounded by children dressed in wizard costumes. Right? And she got no shit for that, right? But she should have done. But now she's finally reaping the rewards of her own, you know, misguided fucking points of view in another way. And so that's fine. But I wanted to talk about her new book, The Ink Black Heart. Now, The Ink Black Heart is a 1200 page crime thriller. Uh, the, uh, about a female ce online celebrity who gets cancelled on Twitter for controversial views regarding people who are transgender. Uh, she, has, she is harassed, uh, abused, has her docks dropped and is ultimately stabbed to death. Oh, I should say, spoiler alert! Now, the book itself has come under multiple problems, um, not the least of which is not just uh, whether or not it's a good read, but the problem seems to be that, at least on the uh, Kindle version, that it is actually impossible to read it. Like, it is physically unreadable. As many of the reviews have pointed out, it has been formatted in such a way that it is impossible to actually make out what a lot of the text is saying. Now, the reason for this is because the... Uh, the actual, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, pages and a lot of the dialogue and story plays out uh, in the form of fake tweets that are being directed you know, and conversations that are happening on Twitter. And unfortunately, she, uh, J.K. Rowling, did not, you know, have the foresight to see how this would look on Kindle. And as some people have shared, you get some pages that are almost completely blank but for a bit of text maybe at the top or the bottom and then and even when the the text is in order it's really difficult to decipher what is going on and who is saying what but that aside a lot of people you know a lot of a lot of the, you know, people have given it high ratings on uh, you know on Amazon whether or not these are people who are just supporting her for the hell of it or not i don't know you could probably say the same for people giving it uh, bad reviews but nevertheless a woman of J.K. Rowling's stature releasing a book that is physically impossible to read on one of the most popular forms of you know of, of reading of, of uh, reading a book is enough is enough in and of itself. And a lot of the reviews have say have been shall we say mixed. You know, with some people even trying to be as generous as possible, only being able to push it and give it three stars out of five. One of the more interesting things is that all of the tweets are, uh, you know, are allegedly uh, fake. However, there are a couple that appear to actually have been uh, have been take have been given accounts that are real. Um, one of which is, uh, you know, is an incredibly, you know, it, it has got a has got a uh, Twitter name that it would be almost impossible for you to guess random, randomly. And the account actually now exists. In fact, the guy who owns the account found this out and posted this. I would show you what my, what the rest of his Twitter account actually says, uh, except I can't do that because his, his account is dedicated exclusively, it seems, to retweeting hardcore gay pornography. But that aside, what I really find interesting is that when you hear the story of what happens in the book, you know, famous female celebrity, has controversial opinions on people who are trans, gets cancelled, gets harassed, gets docked blah, on Twitter, you think, well, obviously, this is based on J.K. Rowling's personal experience. You know, this is her writing about what happened to her, but in a fictionalised world. That would make sense, wouldn't it? But that's not what's happening. In fact, she's claiming the exact opposite. She's actually trying to claim that she wrote this before all of this stuff happened to her, and now the, all of this has played out. She's claiming that friends of her saying, oh, it's almost as if you're clairvoyant. It's almost as if you're a psychic, JK. I'm just going to say that, say that 
this is horseshit. There's no, and n nobody, as far as I know, I know, apart from maybe the most delusional and, you know, d you know d d demented of fan fanboys, is going to actually believe that. Right? It's just, you know, there are so many coincidences you can put in before you, before you believe, how on, is this actually possible and real? And for me, not enough people are focusing on this because I think this is really important. Because let's look at it logically. There's no reason that J.K. Rowling would have to lie about this. She could have said, yes, it's based on my personal experience. You know, that's what I did. But then it kind of, you know, then it would have just been, you know, like, okay, fair enough. The people who were going to buy it, you know, and enjoy the book would have bought it anyway. The people who were going to hate it for whatever reason would have hated it anyway. So why has she decided to go down this road of claiming that this was all written and predicted beforehand? Now, if you want my opinion, I think this is a very manipulative tactic on her part because the very important aspect, the one thing about the character in the book that does not mirror J.K. Rowling's life is the fact that at the end of it she is stabbed and murdered by one of these online you know social justice transgender nutters and that's the important part because if she has written this before it happens and it plays out as she predicted what she's actually fit what she's effectively telling you with this book is that if I mur don't be surprised if I end up murdered. She's trying to fucking make you think that she's going to be murdered. And she's also trying to add and make, make, you know, make it look like she is a visionary of some sorts. Right? And the reason this is important is because there is only other, in my lifetime, uh, there is only other one example to this you know, that is similar. You know, that has played out in a similar way. See, back in 2002, there was a young lad who wrote a, who wrote a script. He wrote a fictional action movie script for, uh, for a film, an action film that was based on real events. And he struggled to get this movie made. A lot of people didn't want to go near it because it was, A, it's an action film, costs a lot of money, and because it was based on real events, it would make it controversial. So he tried to make it himself, but he couldn't actually get it made uh, because, you know, he, you know, himself, because A, obviously action films are very difficult to make. But then one day he bumped into a producer and he tried, he, you know, this lad tried to pitch this script for an action film to him. And this guy told him he would actually be much more successful if he actually made this action film and turned it into a documentary. And that's exactly what he did. That young man was a guy called Dylan Avery and the script that he wrote was for a film called Loose Change. Loose Change originally started as a fictional action movie based on this idea that a load of, uh, that a group of, a group of friends you know, look into the 9-11 attacks and discovered that actually these attacks, there was a big conspiracy behind it. Now, obviously, it's very going to be, you know, there's not a lot of people going to want to go near that because you're dealing with real life events and it might be considered somewhat insensitive. And so a lot of people didn't want to go near it. Plus, again, it's a bit of a difficult thing to recreate, you know. Uh, and so instead, Dylan went away and came back and pretended that this action film, this fictional script that he had written was actually true and all of the conspiracies he'd written about in the script were, had actually happened and were actually real. Now, that is the level I want you to fucking understand that J.K. Rowling has found herself at. Dylan Avery, right, for whatever you think, this was him as a young man desperately trying to find some way to break into it. This is J.K. Rowling who's already there. She has fallen so low that she is resorting to the same tactics that Dylan Avery did in order to create loose change. And just like, just like with, uh, just like 
with J.K. Rowling not having to tell you that, you know, she could have, you know, just told you that it was based on her real life. Dylan Avery didn't have to tell you that he wrote this fictional script. But again, he did it because he wanted to make himself seem like a, like a visionary, like he had a special mind. And that, I think, says, speaks volumes for how far down the fucking pecking order of relevance that J.K. Rowling has got when she's so desperate now that she now has to create a fictional script and lie about, about it becoming real life. And that's all I've got to say on the subject there, folks. I'm Dick Coughlin, Brother Neuro. Thank you for listening. Like, comment, subscribe, support me on Patreon. And where there's no sense, there's no feeling.